So welcome to the afternoon session. So a small thing is left uh, in uh, disinfection. Let us continue that portion. <coughs> the thing left is left is types of chlorination. Okay, so rechlorination post chlorination. Double chlorination, super chlorination, dechlorination, and breakpoint chlorination. Okay, chlorination before filtration is called pre-chlorination. Chlorination before filtration. Pre-chlorination. Post-chlorination means chlorination after filtration. Generally, we carry out post-chlorination only. Double chlorination means chlorination before and after filtration. Before and after filtration. It's called double chlorination. Two times you carry out chlorination, it is called double chlorination. Once before filtration, once after filtration. Understood all of them online onsets only. Super chlorination. Chlorinating with the super dose is called super chlorination. Super dose is much more than normal dose. Normally during epidemics, we carry out super chlorination. <coughs> excess dose. Super dose means excess dose. Dechlorination, removal of excess chlorine. Removal of excess chlorine after super chlorination. After super chlorination, normally we carry out dechlorination. Breakpoint chlorination is very, very important. It is a test conducted to fix the chlorine dose. A test conducted to fix the chlorine dose which is to be added to water. Okay? So that we get, it produces stable residual. At the same time, we get protection also in water. Okay? So normally water is dechlorinated by Treating with the sodium thiosulfate. Sodium thiosulfate, if you add water, then water is dechlorinated. Anyway, this and all not required. Important component is here breakpoint chlorination. So it is a test conducted by adding different doses of chlorine and finding the residual against the dose. The test conducted on water for different chlorine dosages and their respective residues. Water by adding different chlorine dosages and finding respective residuals against the dose. Then we will make a plot. From there we come to know the break point. So generally we add chlorine beyond break point. So any dose added beyond break point is called break point chlorination. 
okay test connector and water by adding different amounts of chlorine dosages and finding their respective residues so when you add chlorine to water and if you plot after conducting the test we plot the results right taking residual chlorine this is residual chlorine in milligram per liter this is chlorine dose in milligram per liter <coughs> so this axis chlorine dose this axis so chlorine first as soon as you add react with iron and manganese so total chlorine is consumed no residuals are produced then chlorine react with ammonia and form chloramines chloramines also one of the forms of chlorine therefore it start producing residuals in the form of chloramines so once chloramines are formed no more ammonia is there then chlorine start destroying the microorganisms and as well as chloramines also destroy microorganisms in doing so some amount of chloramines are used so this much amount of chloramines are formed bc amount of chloramines are formed in that cd amount of chloramines are consumed in destroying the organisms after that so there is no more chlorine demand then curve start rising exactly 45 degrees the point from which curve rises 45 degrees is called break point this point is called this point is called break point from this point this curve start rising 45 degrees so this point is called break point the dose again is this point is called break point dose chlorine dose at break point okay this is called so how much amount of chloramines are formed bc amount in that cd amount is consumed still bd amount of chloramines still remain these are chloramines therefore it's called combined chlorine residual this is combined chlorine residual residual in the form of chloramines this one and this is free chlorine residual what is this free chlorine residual residual in the form of hcl and ocl this is free chlorine residual the total residual is equal to what free chlorine residual plus combined chlorine residual this is total chlorine residual which give protection at the same time it doesn't produce thms in water no risk no much risk to human beings so total chlorine residual is this much okay so what is happening between a and b so chlorine is reacting with iron and manganese here so oxidation of iron and manganese is occurring it from a to b oxidation of fe2 plus and mn2 plus and what is happening between b to c formation of chloramines chloramines are forming here so formation of chloramines then what is happening between c to d from here to here destruction of chloramines chloramines are destroyed to destroy microorganisms destruction of chloramines why chloramines are destroyed to destroy microorganisms so what is happening between d to e this is called d to e formation of free chlorine that is this e so free chlorine is forming in water so it is formation of free chlorine so the point at which you break the point at which from which you, the curve rises 45 degrees is called break point the dose again is break point is called this is called break point chlorine dose so exactly at break point we made the chlorine demand beyond that there is no more demand therefore whatever chlorine extra added beyond break point that appear as a stable residual so this is called break point chlorine dose okay too much crowded here you don't understand this is break point dose break point chlorine dose 
Okay. So from this, what we can calculate? So we are expected to find out total chlorine residual is equal to it is combined chlorine residual that is residual in the form of chloramines combined chlorine residual plus free chlorine residual both of them together known as total chlorine residual how to find out combined chlorine residual combined chlorine residual is equal to residual at break point exactly at break point whatever chlorine residual is there that is called chlorine residual at break point that is called combined chlorine residual free chlorine residual is equal to so any residual at beyond break point 45 degrees it lies 45 degrees significance means what x is equal to y x milligram extra yard beyond break point x milligram appear as a free chlorine residual y milligrams extra yard y milligram appear as a free chlorine residual therefore free chlorine residual is equal to what is free chlorine residual actual chlorine dose minus chlorine dose at break point so you will get that x value x is known so y you will get y is nothing but free chlorine residual x is equal to y because 45 degrees it is so that is how we can work out to work out these things that curve is very very helpful so we need to add chlorine dose such that free chlorine residual should not be more than 0.2 so chlorine dose is fixed such that free chlorine residual is more than 0.2 if it is more than 0 0.2 high risk of THM therefore we add control that value by adjusting this one understood so people often confuse to follow this good afternoon all of you yeah koshish karunga bhaiya वो लोग देना है दिया तो माइक करूंगा फुल कोर्स भी करूंगा शो सर साहब ने विश्वास सटेन या विल ट्राई सो क्वेश्चन दे लास्क न्यूमेरिकल क्वेश्चन रिलेटेड टू दिस सो क्लोरिन डोज इज फेज सच दैट it produces stable residuals any dose added beyond break point that produces stable residuals any chlorine dose added to water beyond break point would produce stable chlorine residuals in water which give effective and long protection effective protection will get because of free chlorine long protection will get because of chloramines long protection in water that is the reason why we need to work out that break point break point any dose any chlorine dose added to water beyond break point to produce a stable chlorine residuals that which will give effective and long protection will get that is the reason why we need to find out that break point understood okay let us try few numericals example continuation to the morning session it is maybe ninth question or 10th question
अरे वाटर द डोज इज इट ब्रेक पॉइंट is 1.5 mg per liter and acetyl chlorine at that time found to be 0.3 mg per liter if cumulative chlorine added is milligram per liter then residual chlorine will be then then there was a question <coughs> so as per the as per our knowledge what is given actual chlorine dose added to water is given break point so for a water dosage at break point dosage at break point is how much it is 1.5 this is chlorine dose at break point okay actual chlorine dose added is that is this is this is 1.5 understood no this is given as 1.5 mg per liter actual chlorine added to water is 2 mg per liter This much is actually added. Beyond break point, how much extra added? This is break point. Point for extra added because curve is 45 degrees curve. So beyond break point, x is equal to y. So this is how much extra added beyond break point. This much extra added. I'll draw in the next page, okay? So that you will get idea. Either using the curve, you can solve, or otherwise using your intuition, understanding also you can solve. By understanding the concept also comfortably, you can work out this question numerical. Okay. Let us see now. So chlorine dose at break point is given as. 1.5 mg per liter actual chlorine dose added is cumulative chlorine chlorine dose added is equal to it is 2 mg per liter okay residual at break point is 0.3 mg per liter then i have been asked to find out total chlorine residue so therefore combined chlorine residual is equal to residual chlorine at to break point so which is given as 0.3 mg per liter free chlorine residual is equal to chlorine dose added to water minus chlorine dose at break point i wrote all these points already 
So it is 2 minus 1.5, 0.5 milligram per liter. Therefore, total chlorine residual is equal to it is free chlor combined chlorine residual plus free chlorine residual. So combined chlorine residue is 0.3, free chlorine residue is 0.5, so it is 0.8 milligram per liter. That was the answer for this question. Suppose free chlorine residue only they ask, answer is 0.5. Combined chlorine residue they ask, answer is 0.3. So by approximately plotting rough sketch also you can work out. So what is given is, this is our breakpoint chlorination curve. So this is our break point. Exactly again is break point. The dose is 1.5 milligram per liter. Actual chlorine dose added is beyond break point only 2 milligram per liter. So from here curve rises 45 degrees. This is called break point. So dose again is break point is called break chlorine dose at break point. Okay. Then whatever residual is there at break point is called combined chlorine residual. This is combined chlorine. He has given that is 0.3 in this question. This is 0.3 from here to here. So what is extra chlorine added beyond break point? 45. So it is 0.5 milligram per liter. This 0.5 appear as a free chlorine residual because curve rises 45 degrees from there. 45 degrees at 45 degrees x is equal to y. So at 45 degrees x is equal to y. This also 0.5 milligram per liter only. This is free chlorine residual. So total chlorine residual is equal to 0.5 plus 0.3, 0.8 milligram per liter. This is how you can solve. Understood now? So without uh, uh, numeric without, without remembering equations also just by plotting also you can work out. Okay. This is how we can work out the questions. Let us try one more question. There are some equations which we, which we can also use while carrying out disinfection. They are called kinetics of disinfection. So when you carry out disinfection, what happens? Organisms in water slowly decrease. Initially exponentially decreases and attain asymptotic value. The initial number of organisms in water are N0. Organisms at any point of time, organisms remain in water is at any time t, it is Nt. So N0 minus Nt is number of organisms removed from water. <coughs> destroyed by disinfection. This is N0 minus Nt. This number of organisms versus time. Time plot. So from this you can calculate percentage removal. Already I wrote this. Percentage removal of organisms is equal to number of organisms removed in a given time t by initial number of organisms into 100. Sometimes we also work out log removal. Removal in terms of logarithmic scale. So log removal is equal to, so log 10 it is n0 minus log 10 nt. One time in gate exam they ask log removal. Log removal means log 10 n0 minus log 10 nt. That means they measure on logarithmic scale. So this measured on 100 scale. 
This measured on scale of five logarithmic scale. This is both of them same only. New years and all people use this. Similarly, number of organisms remained at any time t. N t is equal to it is n naught into e power minus k t. So this equation is known as Chick's law. Chick has proposed this equation. People call it as Chick's law. So where k is equal to disinfection rate constant. T is equal to contact time, or exposure time, or detention time. Very useful all these relations, and you can also work out efficiency of removal. Efficiency of removal is nothing but it is also nothing nothing but percentage removal of organisms. Efficiency expressed in percentage is equal to it is n naught minus n t by n naught into hundred. We substitute. N T in terms of N naught, it is N naught in T power minus K T by N naught into hundred. So if I remove all N naughts, then I can also write efficiency of the system is equal to it is one minus E power minus K T into hundred. Using this expression, also you can find out percentage removal or efficiency. You get in percentage, so and so percentage you get. Okay. So this is how we can work out so many number of things. Let us try to solve one question. Using this expression, okay, so that you become familiar related to all questions. So this question has been asked in Gate 2014. A flow rate of two six seven zero meter cube per day of day. Is to be a flow rate of water is to be disinfected the laboratory data of disinfection studies With the chlorine dose yields the model N T is equal to N naught into E power minus point one four five T. Okay, this is also given to you. Where n t is equal to number of microorganisms surviving at time t. Surviving at time t, n naught is equal to number of microorganisms present initially. The volume of disinfection unit in meter cube required to achieve ninety-eight percent kill off microorganisms is dash. I will find out that 
Easy question only. What is that efficiency is equal to n naught into e power minus k t? Here what is given? The efficiency equation. But what equation is given here? Efficiency is equal to n naught into e power minus 0.145 t. So instead of k, it is as given 0.14 t is equal to number of microorganisms. T, is, t also given. What is t? Time t in minutes. Time t. T is given in minutes. Okay. So if you compare this with uh, this one, what is this? Uh, sorry. Efficiency is given as n naught. Oh, sorry. Actually, what is nt? n naught into e power minus kt. So instead of k as given 0.145, where t is given in minutes, k should be in terms of 1 by minute. Therefore, then only you get number. Okay? If t is in seconds, k should be 1 by second. Because the question has mentioned that minutes, so it should be 1 by minute. So k value from this equation is 0.145, 1 by minute. So, you have to make, find out this one. What is efficiency? Efficiency is equal to it is n naught into 1 minus e power minus kt into 100. n naught gone, n naught removed, that is already we. We got this equation already, isn't it? n minus e power minus kt into 100. So this is given as 98%. Efficiency is given as 98%, 1 minus e power minus 0.145 into t into 100. So from this you can find out how much time it will take to destroy 98% of organisms. So work out. It is 98 by 100 minus 1. Right? Divided by point one four five. So T value I got 26.97 minutes, 98. So volume of disinfection unit is equal to, this is nothing but contact time or detention time. Something like a detention time only this is. So volume of disinfection unit is equal to Q into T. So Q is given as 2670 meter cube per day that is, so I am converting days into minutes, so 24 by 60 into 26.979, come on simplify, you will get volume of disinfection unit, this is in meter cube per minute into minutes, so you will get answer in meter cube straight away, come on how much, what is the answer? So 2670 by 24 into 60 into 26.979. So it is 50, 50 meter cube. So that was the answer for this question. Understood? So they can link to a the other things with the help of this one. Ok. 
Okay? So that is how we can solve the problems in dis disinfection. I hope, hope I covered everything in disinfection numericals especially. Then let us go to next topic. Miscellaneous water treatment methods. You can solve any number of problems. More problems is all, more you will get comfort in the concepts. Miscellaneous. Water treatment methods. So main topics are completed. Main topics are sedimentation, coagulation, filtration, disinfection. Anything extra you learn beyond that, there is a bonus for you. So here we try to talk about aeration. Second, water softening. Third, reverse osmosis, electrodialysis. Distillation, fluoridation and defluoridation. Then treatment with the activated carbon. So these are the eight topics which we are going to discuss in miscellaneous water treatment methods. Some of them are used for groundwater, some of them are used for removing a high salt content or high TDS values, reverse osmosis, electrodialysis, distillation, etc. They are used in desalination of water, fluoridation, defluoridation. So there are hundreds of technologies are available at our disposal. So which are we need to use that and carry out the job. Let us see what is about aeration. So, aeration is nothing but method of exposing water to atmosphere. Normally, then uh, water when water contains high amount of undesirable dissolved gases and water is deficient of oxygen, we carry out aeration. So, aeration is nothing but method of exposing water to atmosphere. Why we carry out aeration? 
Separation of water is carried out for two purposes. Carried out to first. To expel undesirable dissolved gases such as carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide this is called desorption of gases expelling gases from what is called desorption or second is to enrich water with oxygen enriching water with oxygen is called what is this a absorption of gases one is called desorption of gases the other one is absorption of gases naturally it happens So, concentration of any gas in water governed by dc by dt proportional to is cs minus ct governed by this equation. So, CS is called change in uh, CS is called saturation concentration of any gas. In water, CT is known as actual concentration of any gas in water. Okay. <clears throat> this actual concentration of any gas in water we can work out by Henry's law. The Ct is equal to it is K times Ps. It is taken as this is governed by Henry's law. Actual concentration of any gas in water that depends on Henry's law. Partial pressure, pressure otherwise. So P is equal to partial pressure, partial pressure exerted by air on the surface of water on liquid surface. Partial pressure applied by any gas on liquid surface. K is some constant. Mole fraction of any gas present in that we can work out. K is known as Henry's constant. This law is called Henry's law. This equation is called last year gate exam one question came from this. Henry's law. Okay. Saturation concentration is constant. If a CT value is greater than CS, then what happens? Desorption of gases happens. CT value is less than CS, then what happens? Absorption of that gas happens. So it all depends on this one. In this law, how much gas diffuses into water. So, this much idea is there more than sufficient. So, normally water contain, usually groundwater contain more of H2S. Aeration is normally carried out for groundwater. Groundwater is rich with carbon dioxide H2, H2S and poor with oxygen levels. Therefore, to improve that, we carry out aeration. Groundwater is full of carbon dioxide and H2S and deficient of oxygen. 
therefore aeration is usually required for ground water surface water not required therefore aeration is carried out for ground water understood ground water badly need aeration okay this aeration of water we carry out by two methods one dispersion of air into water water into air by using uh fountain aerators cascade aerators or by using tray towers we can carry out dispersion of water into air second one is dispersion of air into water first one is dispersion of water into air second one is dispersion of air into water this is called diffuse aeration diffuse aerators are used only one type of technology anyway we can carry out i'll show you how exactly it is done so in case of fountain aerators fountain water fountain kind of thing this is this is a fountain at center of fountain you will find one nozzle so a jet of water that is broken into small small droplets issued into atmosphere a jet stream of water broken into small small droplets with the help of nozzle and again that water collected in the still basin this water get back to the rest while issued into atmosphere then this water and air exposed to something will be dissolved something will be absorbed so it takes oxygen it gives up carbon dioxide and h2s water again water is collected this is called fountain aerators you might have seen in municipal parks and all that fountain is used for beautification purpose this fountain is a aerator fountain aerator similarly cascading cascading is nothing but a waterfall kind of thing artificial waterfall we create step like arrangement so water cascade down a thin sheet of water right roll down from top to bottom in doing so the water get exposed to atmosphere atmosphere contain air that is how right we are it a sheet of water roll from top to bottom and finally accumulate here so while moving down this water sheet get exposed to atmosphere so it takes oxygen and it dissolve carbon dioxide and h2s this is sheet of water water sheet this is called cascade aerator this is similarly tray towers so we use two trays one is upper tray second one is lower tray upper tray is perforated lower tray is solid upper tray contains perforations perforation means small small holes and water is poured into upper tray this water drop down from upper tray to lower tray in doing so this water get exposed to atmosphere right when it get exposed to atmosphere carbon dioxide and h2s it give back to atmosphere it takes oxygen from atmosphere that is how water is aerated this is called tray tower and one more is diffuse aerator diffuse aerator water flow from one end of the container to other end of the container like fish aquariums is on a fish aquarium water will move from one end to other end this flow in it is flow out then oxygen is put into air a compressed air is applied from bottom this is called compressed air 
air is from applied from bottom of the container this is called compressed air air under pressure compressed air means applied from bottom so this air bubbles pass through water so these are the air bubbles so whatever required water it takes from air bubbles whatever is not required for water it gives to air bubbles so absorption desorption occur something it will take something it will give that's all okay. this is called diffuse aerator so this is how we can carry out right aeration okay this much idea is more than sufficient gate exam one question is been asked from aeration let me check that question is there or not with me Let me check that question. So partial pressure of the gas is proportional to C. I don't know correct. Let me try to solve question given in the exam. Don't have question. Great question. One question is there. Anyway, check out. You'll find out. Okay then, I don't have question with me. Next, water softening. Water softening is water softening is nothing but removal of excess hardness from water. Water is often hard, therefore it require for groundwater. Then 
therefore for ground water water softening technology is applied usually ground water only we treat for water softening both aeration and water softening okay understood now so there are methods water softening methods many methods are there some of them we already know one is boiling second one is lime treatment third one is lime soda process fourth one is ion exchange process or ion exchange method these many methods are there so boiling remove only temporary hardness remove only carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium only removed by boiling ch stands for carbonaceous hardness carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium that is carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium okay lime treatment so lime remove carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium and magnesium and also non carbonaceous hardness caused by magnesium okay but doesn't remove car non carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium so therefore to improve that portion we use lime soda process nch means non carbonaceous understood no lime soda process lime remove carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium and magnesium and non carbonaceous hardness caused by magnesium soda remove non carbonaceous hardness caused by calcium so one more is ion exchange method or ion exchange process people also call it as zeolite process zeolite method or zeolite process so this method produce zero hard water that is complete hardness we can remove that is total hardness is removed so in this method hardness causing cations are exchanged with the non hardness causing cations that's why it's called ion exchange method hardness causing cations
So I'll exchange with a non oddness causing cations. What are the oddness causing cations? Calcium and magnesium are exchanged with a non oddness causing cation such as sodium. So, calcium and magnesium are exchanged with sodium, that's why it's called ion exchange process. Such as calcium and magnesium are exchanged with non-hardness causing cations. Such as sodium. So that exchange happens in a at a place called ion exchanger. So water having hot water, we pass through this ion exchanger. It's called ion exchange material. What is that ion exchange material? Geolite. A bed of geolite is packed here. Geolite bed. This is. solid bed. Geolite is a mixture of sodium plus aluminum plus silicate. We mix all these three things, you get geolite. So this is packed in a container. This is called ion exchanger. We apply water having full hard water. So the hard water is caused by calcium and magnesium Ca2 plus Mg2 plus and water again collected here we will get here pseudo hard water that means it appeared to be hard but it is not hard, it's soft water so here calcium and magnesium are retained by geolite so the space left by calcium and magnesium in water filled with sodium so water coming out full of sodium so sodium cause pseudo hardness to water, pseudo hard water will get, pseudo hard water means false hardness, that is soft water only, that is how it happens, understood, so this, this is called ion exchanger, geolite is an ion exchange medium, geolite is ion exchanger, so sodium present in geolite given to water, calcium magnesium present in water taken by geolite, so, geolite takes calcium and magnesium, space led by calcium and magnesium fill with the sodium. That's how it gets rid of hardness. So, it's called hot. It is called ion exchange process. This process yield zero hard water. Complete hardness you can remove. Understood? Okay, next. Let us try one question related to this. This question has been asked in gate exam. The gate question the hardness of the groundwater groundwater sample was found to be four twenty milligram per liter as CSCO three a softener. Containing ion exchange resins was installed
to reduce total hardness to 75 milligram per liter as CaCO3 before supplying to for four households. Four houses they are supplying water. Question is each household gets treated water at a rate of five forty liters per day. If the efficiency of software is hundred percent. Bypass flow rate expressed in liters per day is dash the question this question has been asked in gate two thousand sixteen. <coughs> I want to try all of you. I'll give one minute time to you. Let me see how many of you work out. Is it common sense you can work out? So what is given to you is this is ion exchanger. You pass all water through ion exchanger, you will get zero hard water because you hundred percent efficient it is. But zero hard water is not recommended. Little hardness in water is good for health. 
So you have to maintain hardness 75 milligram per liter before supply is made to public. So to maintain that 75 milligram per liter, this is a what he has done is some water he has passed it through ion exchanger, some water he bypassed. Okay. Some water passed it through ion exchanger, some water is bypassed. Bypassed means without passing through ion exchanger. And again mixed with this water. Water passed through ion exchanger. Some water is going like this, some water is going like this. So after collecting this, your hardness should not be more than here. Here Q amount of water. So this is C in let us assume C in or C1, whatever it may be. Let us assume it is C1. Okay, C in, which is equal to C1. It is 420 milligram per liter. So some water we take like this. Q1 amount of water is taken like this with the C1 concentration. And Q2 amount of water passed through an exchanger with concentration C1. By the time this Q2 again collected here, concentration become C2 which becomes 0. Here Q1, C1 join with this water and add here. So after adding here, again it become Q with concentration is C out, which is nothing but C mix. We are mixing two different waters, which should be 75 milligram per liter as CaCO3. That was the question. So question is what amount of water to be bypassed? What is Q1 such that C mix is not more than 75 milligram per liter? How much amount of water to be bypassed? So what is Q? Q is equal to number of households into per capita water supply per household. Per capita or per house, not per capita. Understood now? Efficiency of ion exchanger is 100 percent. If all water if it pass through ion exchanger, what happens? Zero hard water will get here. C out should be zero, but zero is not allowed. So he has given C in. C in is assumed as C1, which is equal to 420 milligram per liter. C out, that is nothing but C mix, which must supposed to be 75 milligram per liter as CaCO3. Hardness is expressed in terms of milligram per liter as CaCO3. And Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2, because Q only bifurcating into two flows, again joining there. Okay. This Q is nothing but this Q is equal to number of households into water supply per household, rate of supply per household. How many houses? Four houses. Rate of supply is 540 liters per day. So total Q is equal to how much it is? 540 into 4. 540 into 4 it is 2160 liters per day. Okay. So this Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2. Then if I write C mix equation here, mix formula, two different solutions having two different here. Mix I am mixing here. So it becomes from here it, it becomes C mix. So C mix formula if I write, what is C mix formula? Mix formula two different two or more number of solutions if you mix. Concentration of mix is equal to C mix Q1 into C1 plus Q2 into C2 by Q1 plus Q2. Mass in is equal to mass out. So Q1 into C1 plus Q2 into C2 by Q. Since Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2. Q1 plus Q2 is nothing but Q only. Okay. C mix is 75. Q1 is unknown. C1 is 420. Q2 is also unknown, but C2 is 0 by 2160. The only unknown is Q1, you can find out. Q1 is equal to bypass flow rate. How much water is bypassed? Which is equal to 2160 into 75 by 420. Two marks question in gate exam. So it is 385.714 liters per day. So that is how we can work out. Mix formula indirectly I have been asked to use mix formula. Okay. 
Okay? So we work out questions like this. Next method is reverse osmosis. High salt content present in water in dissolved form. Dissolved form means tedious form, total dissolved solids. Removed by this method. Normally, we apply sea water. So, this method is widely used in desalination of water. Desalination of water. Desalination means converting sea water into fresh water. Converting saline water in sea into fresh water. Saline water that is sea water into potable water, fresh water. It's called desalination. <coughs> okay? Understood? Salt free water otherwise. Desalination technique. In reverse, it, it is a it, it, it is an mem it is a membrane separation process. So here we use membrane. It is a membrane. Membrane is fine filter media. The fine filter it is nothing but fine filter. Very fine filter. One side of membrane, you have, we keep salt water. So this side, salt water. This side, fresh water. Normally, nothing is applied. So, fresh water go and join with the salt water. Fresh water is contaminated. This is called osmosis. This is called osmosis. Reverse osmosis means what? Reversing the flow direction through membrane by applying the force, external force. And salt water side, if you apply force. So, during osmosis, this is called osmosis. Reverse osmosis, reversing the flow direction through membrane. So, this is a membrane. So, this side of the membrane is salt water. Other side of the membrane is fresh water, reversing the flow direction by applying the force here. By applying external force, pressure. Then, when you reverse the flow direction by applying the pressure, external pressure, then what happens? Salt water start passing through membrane. So, membrane does not allow salt particles along with water. So, salt particles are retained one side of the membrane. Salt free water reaches to the other side of the membrane. So, this is called salt. That's how separation happened. This is called membrane separation process. Okay. So it also they also salt water become fresh water. This is called reverse osmosis. So reversing the flow direction by applying the external force is called reverse osmosis. In osmosis, what happens? Fresh water joins the salt water. In reverse osmosis, salt water joins the fresh water passing through membrane. So when salt water try to join the fresh water passing through membrane, 
while passing through membrane membrane doesn't permit salt particle to pass through it so all the salt particle is retained one side of the membrane only salt free water reaches to the other side of the membrane that's how it happens it's called reverse osmosis reversing the flow direction clear now hope it is clear to you Similarly, electrodialysis. Electrodialysis also a membrane suppression process used for desalination of water. So there we use pressure force. Here we use electric force. So desalination of water is carried out by this method. is also a membrane separation process but here we use electric forces instead of using pressure force here we use electric force this electrodialysis cell this one membrane is another membrane two membranes are used here one is called cationic membrane other one is called anionic membrane this side of the electrodialysis cells act as a cathode this side of the electrodialysis cell act as a anode right cathode carry negative charge anode carry positive charge cathode carry negative charge anode carry positive charge so what are having these ions when you try to pass through this salt water when you pass through this right then they become fresh water by the time it reaches here so the positively charged cations they pass through this membrane attracted to negatively charged cathode negatively charged anions attracted to positively charged cathode that's how separation happens so here separation happens due to electric forces so ions are separated hardness causing ions are separated or salt content is removed by electric force in this method electric forces are used for separating the high salt content from water so all the salt accumulate here accumulate here between the brain the form of a brain okay so fresh water you can collect that it's called electrodialysis similarly distillation distillation also used for same purpose so it is also desalination method 
So in this method what we do? Salt water. First we vaporize. Then it produces vapors. Those vapors again we collect and condensed. Conden vaporization, condensation. Then that produces distilled water. Distilled water is pure water which is free from all salts. So salt water upon vaporization produces vapor. That vapor again collected and condensation carried out. Cool. Condensation means cooling. That produces again pure water. This pure water also called distilled water. Drinking purpose we don't need, but some purposes they use this water. <coughs> Salt free water. So this is called distillation, vaporization and condensation. That's how it happens. So all these are desalination techniques. In addition to this, we also carry out Fluoridation and defluoridation of water. What is fluoridation? Addition of sodium fluoride to water. To increase fluoride's concentration in water above 1 milligram per liter it is known as fluoridation. Understood? So, fluorides we require more than 1 milligram per liter. Not Whenever water is less than 1 milligram per liter, we go for fluoridation. Defluoridation. Removal of excess fluorides from water. <laughs> to reduce fluorides concentration less than 1.5 milligram per liter is known as defluoridation. Defluoridation is removal of fluorides. Fluoridation means addition of fluorides. Understood? Removal of fluorides is called defluoridation. Addition of fluorides is called fluoridation. Okay, so this deep fluoridation of water we carry out by different methods. Treating treatment with the sodium activated alumina.
or Nalgonda method. We also have got Nalgonda method. In Nalgonda method, they add three things. One is alum. Second one is bleaching powder. Third one is lime, quick lime, lime powder. These three things are added to water to remove fluorides from water. So Nalgonda method, Nalgonda is a place where people of Nalgonda suffered with fluorosis. People of Nalgonda only found a solution to fluorosis. So Nalgonda method, what you need to add? Alum, bleaching powder and lime, quick lime or lime. And it produces precipitate and if it is allow that if we separate the precipitates and water will be free from fluorides. Okay. In addition to that, treatment with activated carbon. Activated carbon treatment is used for remove color. Activated carbon is a good absorber. Absorber or absorber, absorbent. Absorbent. Passing water through a bed of activated carbon. Carbon, remove, color, odor, and improve taste of water. So for color removal, normally we treat with activated carbon. Activated carbon is nothing but a, the empty coconut shell. If it is burnt at elevated temperature, we get activated carbon. If you pass water through a bed of activated carbon, you can get rid of the color problem, smell problem, and as well as it also improves taste of water. So this much idea is there more than sufficient related to miscellaneous water treatment methods. Hundreds of methods are available to treat water, but uh, it is practically not possible to learn all these methods in a short period of time. So this much idea is there more than sufficient for you, exam point of view. For exam point of view, this is sufficient. That's all. This is about uh, water treatment. It's important uh, topics are sedimentation, coagulation, filtration, and disinfection. Get exam between these two, you get one two marks question. Between these two, you get one more two marks question. Get exam. So this much idea is there, more than sufficient. All numericals, if you know, in sedimentation, coagulation, filtration, and disinfection, comfortably you can score four marks in gate exam. Okay? So, now you are comfortable, very comfortable. Now let us see water distribution system. So, treated water is distributed to public living in a community with the help of a well-planned piped water distribution system. So treated water supplied to public with the help of piped water distribution system piped water distribution system. <sighs> A 
a piped water distribution system consists of so many number of things network of pipes just if have pipes no use pumps pipes pumps third distribution reservoirs fourth different walls fifth water meters sixth fire hydrants all these things put together it is called water distribution system water meters okay let us see what are the different types of water distribution systems that is available One is gravity system. Two is direct pumping system. And third one is gravity and pumping system. Or some people call it as dual system so three types of distribution systems are available so what type of system that is best suitable for your community that depends on topography of your community and as well as the local conditions Okay, let us see about gravity system. So normally we apply this gravity, imply gravity system where the city is at lower elevation than the source source is at higher elevation city is at lower supply is at lower elevation suitable for places where source is at higher elevation than supply then you can apply this system this you are source treated water we store here at elevated point 
and supply is made to the low ground somewhere here where city is at lower elevation this were city these are high rise buildings in a city trees so this is a source water is there at source which is at higher elevation this is supply supply point city okay so from here we supply water to public with the help of pipelines this is a pipeline carrying water so to this building we supply water to this building we supply water to this building like this water will be keep on going into the system this is water okay this much amount of energy is available this is called total energy line it's kind of bernoulli's principle this is total energy line by the time water reaches to the city some energy is used up due to head loss due to friction still so much energy is available this is called hydraulic gradient line so this much energy is used up still so much energy is available water comfortably reach everybody without pumping nowhere pumping is used here directly water is supplied to public the system is called direct pumping system gravity system sorry no pumping is involved here economical system also then second system is understood now this one so next method is direct pumping system suitable where source and supplier at same elevation suitable or places where source and supply are at same elevation so this is a source this is a supply point
So the water is there in the reservoir here, is a source. This is supply place. So here we use a pump. A pump of very high capacity we use. That pump collect water and supply water to the individuals and as well as is a pump. So pumping is involved in the system. So nowhere it is stored without storing anywhere directly we can supply to the public direct pumping system. So what reaches to the consumer. So you can have pressure control any amount of pressure you can have. So now at the time of pumping pressure may shoot up like this. It may go anywhere here. So much energy some energy is used up obviously. So pressure is in your control. You can supply water with any 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 pressure. The hydraulic gradient line. So everything is in your control. Whereas in case of direct pumping system, pressure is not in your control. You can't increase the pressure. You can't decrease the pressure. But here you want to increase the pressure, you can increase. You can't. You can decrease the pressure. You can decrease. When demand increases, supply you can increase by rotating pump, by operating pump at a different speed. When demand decreases, we can also decrease the supply by rotating pump at different speed by adjusting the pump speed pump of the sp uh, speed of the pump. Then demand meet de supply meet the demand. So therefore, we don't require any storage anywhere in the system. Straight away, water can reach everybody. Direct pumping you can meet the demand. But costly system, expensive system, it is. The reason being, pumping is very expensive. Which require power. Okay, gravity system economical because there is no way we pump water anywhere in the system. The third one is gravity and pumping system, dual system. We'll also call it as dual system. So the system also we use better than direct pumping system. Direct pumping system, see now, whenever you carry out repairs to the pumps, you can't supply water to the public. Similarly, when there is no power, supply can't be made to the public. To overcome that problems, they have developed this. Suitable for places where source and supply are at same elevation. But there are so many advantages over direct pumping system. Here also we use pump. What is pumped into system? This is a city. High rise buildings. There are the trees. So here we use pump, the pump, supply is made to this building with the help of pumps. But we also construct one elevated reservoir, a reservoir is constructed here, okay, distribution reservoir we construct here, the ground it is. A reservoir at highest elevation is constructed. Here also we store water. So the water will be sometimes we also pumping into reservoir. Water will be going there. This is reservoir. Elevated reservoir we call it a distribution reservoir so as and when necessity arises we also draw water from reservoir and supply is made to public so sometimes water go into reservoir sometimes water is drawn from reservoir so at the time of pumping so energy level shoot up you can have any amount of energy 
so we have got hydraulic radiant line total energy line this is atlas due to friction similarly from this direction also we have got energy lines so this much amount of water is available so comfortably you can reach there this is total energy line this is hydraulic gradient line so whenever supply is more supply greater than demand so excess water stored in reservoir excess water goes to reservoir stored in reservoir when supply is less than demand then deficit water drawn from reservoir drawn from reservoir okay that's how reservoir help us to meet the supply to meet the supply matching with the demand so supply match with the demand because of reservoir with reservoir is not there it is not possible to match the demand so whenever supply is less than demand then deficit water drawn from reservoir and made to supply made to public so that is how reservoir help us so supply is made by direct pumping supply also made by made from reservoir reservoir is not to, continuously operated as and when necessity, necessity arises we use we draw water from reservoir and supply whenever excess water remain here we take to the reservoir and then store there so reservoir is meant for meeting the supply meeting the demand so we match our supply with the demand with the help of reservoir so that also part and parcel of system but very expensive method more reliable method this is even pumping when pumps are uh, requ pump require repair works and all still supply is made to public uh, because drawing water from reservoir okay so power failure power is not there you cannot operate pump then also supply can be made to public by drawing water from reservoir so that is how supply meet the demand in case of this system this is source this is supply point okay so this is different types of systems so the type of system that we employ that depends on the local topography based on local conditions we decide which system best suitable for us okay so they are conducting mock exams so you can use this code and enroll to the mock exams enroll for free code is get civil you can freely enroll Test series also available.
Okay, I will continue my session in the evening. So today I will complete this topic, water supply engineering, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. So by 10 o'clock, I will be finishing water supply engineering. Okay. So I will continue my continue my session today 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. so I'll wind up what supply engineering okay okay thank you